of society. It is us and our actions that make the world what it is. This is not about criticizing government because we are government. All of your mayors, your senators, your congress people, your president comes from the people. If we could somehow raise the consciousness of our people we will also raise the consciousness of our government. This is a bottom-up solution. Here's the solution. In every area of a city, there's an area that nobody goes or pays any attention to. It's underdeveloped. Every city has it. Hip-hop is asking that you give us that area of your city, meaning the same way you have a Chinatown, or a little Italy, or a little Armenia, and little Greece, have a little hip hop. Come on, come on. Can we get an area in your city where the wealth of our culture is concentrated in one area? Can we get an area in your city where hip hop is safe? Where people from around the world know that there's a place, a mecca, that they can come to and enjoy hip hop. Do you know what that would do to your tourism in your city? To have a hip hop city, a small section of your city dedicated to the culture of hip hop. Crime lessons in your city, because all the kids are working in the city, working in the hip, or what we call hip hopia. All the kids are working there, jobs in the city, if we just focus and create an area for hip hop in your city. So this is what I believe the solution is, and this is what I leave you with today. Each of us are leaders of the world. Don't take yourself for granted. That's right. You are divine, actually. I don't have enough time to get into that, black people. But grab your responsibility. Rise up. Civilization is not technology. Let us be more civil. Thank you. Peace and welcome to the Temple of Hip Hop. I am KRS-One. The Temple of Hip Hop is a hip hop preservation ministry, archive, school, and society. We started in 1996 with the affirmation, I am hip hop. Also, rap is something we do. Hip hop is something we live. We are not just doing hip hop, we are hip hop. These slogans and statements and even philosophies uh, is what taught hip hop that it was a culture. And even though many have spoke about, hip, not even many, no, I will say few, some have spoken about hip hop as community, as culture, and so on. It is the temple of hip hop that actually did the work and will continue to do the work to establish hip hop as an international culture of peace and prosperity. We are specific in our approach to hip hop because for us, hip hop is not just a music genre. Hip hop is a way of life. Hip hop is our spiritual path. Hip hop is our worldview, our political worldview. It's the name of our activity in world history. This is hip hop. I'm right now uh, in the temple of hip hop, our new facility here at 55 Ludlow Street in Newark, New Jersey. Now don't run over here yet because this is a city building. You guys who've been studying with us, you know, 
um, how we acquired the space. Big up to Maya Ross J. Baraka. Shout out to Amiri Baraka Jr. Uh, and shout out to Amiri Baraka, the ancestor, the father, uh, on, on that level. Um, it's through that line, through that lineage, through that kingship that we are blessed with this, this teaching facility right now. This facility, however, is a community facility. And even though the community has welcomed me here and do it beyond what you can possibly even imagine, uh, I'm still working with the community. So we're not ready to move in really until about April, May. We hope to open this up for the Temple of Hip Hop only for our membership though during Hip Hop Appreciation Week or during the month of May. Uh, I will be conducting uh, courses, classes here, but only for those who are going to teach when the temple opens up. We're getting our internal structure together over these next few weeks, over these next few months. So, so don't rush over here yet. Uh, unless, of course, you want to come and just be part of a, a, a vibrant community center. But the actual temple of hip hop is going to start around April, May, and of course go forward. We got a lot of work to do in terms of beautifying the place and putting the history of hip hop on the walls and uh, communicating with the graph writers in the community itself as well, MCs, DJs, uh, beatboxers, and so on. Uh, we gotta communicate with them as well. So we got a lot of community work to do, a lot of artistic work to do within the building itself and even on the outside of, of, of the building itself, uh, and so on. So if you wanna help us with that work, please come forward. Uh, we need your skill. I mentioned last week that now more than ever, uh, I'm asking for your support. Uh, we definitely need it. And, and, and what we need is basically skills. Um, those who can paint, those, you, you know, with, uh, those who know how to write grants even grant writers, uh, maybe you're an attorney out there listening to me right now, uh, or someone that might be able to help us uh, with this kind of facility, help us raise funds even for this facility, or put us in the direction of the professionals that we need to teach certain courses. Some of you are professors of, of um, you know, various trades and stuff. Just your presence here uh, uh, is a value. Uh, your presence to teach whenever you can is a value to the, to the whole facility. You know what we're trying to do here as well. Like I said, the Temple of Hip Hop is a hip hop ministry, archive, school, and society. We are hitting the community hard with this concept. What's the, what's the, the this is the short concept. What's the broad concept? Hip Hopia. We talked about that as well. Why is the Temple of Hip Hop here? Well, we're here because this section of, of Newark, which is called Wikwe, Wikwe, uh, ancient Native American term too, by the way. This section called Wikwe is what we want to call hip hopia. And, and it'll take a minute, but not that long uh, to start adding street names uh, reflecting hip hop's culture in this particular area. What we want to do is concentrate the wealth of hip hop in one area. So that $10.5 billion we make every year actually begins to come to us. You know, you know, how many times have, have, have we heard, how many times have we heard, oh, hip hop is worth 10.5 billion. Hip hop is worth every year, it's billion. And you sit in there, you are hip hop and you ain't getting none of that money. How, why is that, how is that possible that we can produce a $10.5 billion culture, but then we struggle to pay mortgage and rent and childcare and cell phone and car note and whatever else we got, but we the culture? That can't be the case. So as part of the leadership of this culture, I intend to do something about that. And the solution that I've come up with, or should I say the solution that God has blessed us with, the vision, is that if we can start a hip hopia, a section of town where we can concentrate in a physical space the wealth of hip hop in that town, then the people of that town, the hip hoppers of that town, will feel the worth, uh, yeah, feel the worth and feel the wealth 
of hip hop concentrated into one area. Not only concentrated into one area, um, like a physical area, but also concentrated into one area in the minds of Americans. Meaning that hip hop is not everywhere anymore. It's not all over the place. You could go to a section of town, like Chinatown, like you, like you have a Chinatown, like you have a little Italy in some places, a little Armenia in some places. You have Native American places that are just sectioned off and, and not reservations, just places that, that, that celebrate specific cultures. In Brooklyn, you got the Caribbean culture there in Flatbush. So why can't we have a hip hop section of town uh, called Hip Hopia? And we focus hip hop's value, its worth, its worth, its wealth right there in this place. And those that are hip hop can come here and learn. Uh, oh, actually, <laughs> not, not only learn, train, uh, get your performance on, but also get money. Straight jobs, that's what we're talking about. We're trying to lower the crime rate in the areas that we live. And, and a large portion of that crime rate comes because of poverty, because of desperateness, because of ignorance, lack of self-esteem, no vision. So the temple of hip hop lands in these areas. Cause you know, this is not the only temple, this is temple number one. This should be temple number two, three, four, five, and around the globe and around the nation. And this is what we're offering, hip hopia. We're teaching citizenship to our people. This is the beginning of lessening crime and, and, and repairing social order, is teach our people what citizenship is really all about. What it's really all about. You know, breaking the laws of your own community, disregarding the ordinances of your own community, disregarding the principles of your own culture. Come on, the methods of your own traditions. This is why we remain poor. This is why we remain unprotected. This is why we remain immature. So the temple of hip hop comes with a plan. And it's not the end all be all plan, but it's a plan that we think is gonna work. If we could form a hip hopia and our children have a place to go, they have a place to make some money at, they got a place to express themselves safely. I think this is where we start marching toward that crimeless society. Because that's what we ultimately want, a crimeless society. I said this over the last uh, weekend, this, just this last weekend, you saw some of the clips uh, just before this, this particular uh, call we're having. I, 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 I was just at the Black Caucus last week I was invited, of course, to pick up the Percy Sutton Lifetime Achievement Award. What an honor that was. <laughs> Let me say now, I am officially black. <laughs> Shout out to the Black Caucus. Uh, but I got this Percy, and Percy Sutton, you should look him up as well. Percy Sutton uh, is a huge figure in the African-American political community and business community. Um, started out as a young attorney for Malcolm X, even. He was Malcolm X's attorney, one of the first attorneys, young, uh, uh, a young attorney for, for uh, Malcolm X, uh, so on. Went on to become a Bronx Borough, Pre um, uh, Manhattan Borough president, uh, and a whole host of other things. Started, um, uh, I, I think it was called, um, well, well, you know what, let me look at it. Hold up, it was, it was uh, look at my notes real quick here. Um, yeah, Inner City Broadcasting Corporation. This is uh, uh, Percy Sutton, and, and a whole host of radio stations came out of that uh, as as well. So this guy Percy Sutton, a huge figure in civil rights, huge figure uh, in um, in black politics as well. The Black Caucus of New York City, uh, of New York State, I should say, uh, met in Albany. And they have their award, which is the Percy Sutton Lifetime Achievement Award uh, that they give to people that, I, that they uh, believe exemplifies the legacy of, of, of Percy Sutton and struggle and revolution. And of course, they gave the award to me. And of course, I am honored, uh, straight up and down. And I thank them for that uh, award. I thank the Black Caucus for that award and for that love. 
because when I got there, it was all hip hop. <laughs> it was, you should have seen it. It was just out of control, okay? Every senator, assemblyman, congresswoman, they, they were calling them out. And as they came out, Biggie came on. As they came out, Wu Tang came on. As they came out, you know, somebody else and all hip hop. And it was a celebration of hip hop. And everybody in the room was hip hop. And that was a major, major, uh, you know, another prophecy fulfilled. It was a major realization about where we're going and how we can get, um, really how we can fulfill the dreams of our ancestors if we all work together right now. This is a sweet moment we're in right now. I don't know how long it's gonna last, but at this particular moment, we're in a sweet moment right now. And, and sadly, sadly, it's because of the bullshit going on in the street. Everything from the police brutality to lack of jobs. And, and even though they say, oh, the jobs are up, nobody feeling that on the street. Nobody really doing what their, what their degree uh, uh, has them do, what they're trained to do. Everybody's scrambling. Everybody hustling. Everybody struggling to make ends meet. People are tired of that life. But you got these politicians talk, 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 talking, and the taxes are going up. You only get half your salary. Your, your, the dignity of work is, is leaving. Nobody, you know, even feels dignified to do work anymore. I mean, come on. We need new leadership. I'm proud to say that when I was at the Black Caucus, I saw that leadership. I actually saw that leadership right there. And not just because they're giving me some kind of an award, but look at who they're giving the award to. I've not changed my views. We get on this call every Sunday. <laughs> Be, have I changed my views at all? No, I have not. We preach our gospel. And my views have always been my views. And, and, and not that I'm a, you know, trying to go against anybody or be argumentative, but I have some strong views. I have some, a way in which I think things should go and they're not going that way. So I argue for my view. Whoop, whoop, as the sound of the police. I argue for my view. You know, it's the black cop killing black kids in Johannesburg. Word. I, you know, so, you know, I, for years, I've advocating, I've advocated an anti-voting position. I'm a high school dropout. I don't have no college degree. I don't have a high school degree. Keep it real. While I sit in this illustrious institution for learning. <laughs> okay. Now look at me. I'm a homeless dude. Okay, that's where I come from. I, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not proud of it. It's just the truth. I come from the literal street. <laughs> that's it. I slept in the street. So this is the dude now. <laughs> okay, I'm in the street. You know my story. Scott LaRock, my social worker. He gets killed along the way. Me and D-Nice continue. D-Nice goes off with Flavor Unit become something that I go on with BDP, saw Justice, Heather B, I, 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 you. Stop the violence movement, human education against lies, temple of hip hop. Now, this guy is who the Black Caucus, which are all government people, political people. They said, this is what exemplifies what we think is a leader today. That's an honor on two sides. That's an honor on two sides. First of all, it's humbling for me. There's no posture on this one. There's no chest poked out on this one. Nah, it's more like hunchback. <laughs> more like, more like tucked in. <laughs> you know, a little, a little more humble about yourself on this one. Because here you have people who I know my ultimate view they can't agree with. But they respect my view so much that they're willing to bring me in, give me their highest honor. And then, of course, you know we got paid that night to rip the party. That was a whole, that was a whole nother separate piece, okay, with Curtis Blow and OG and the Bulldogs and, and a whole host of others, okay, including DJ Sun One. <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, 
they they wanted to honor what they knew the truth was. And not only is it humbling for me, it was humbling for them. And we all got humbled together. And I felt the love in the room, the love in the room for black people. I will say that here too as well. It was a black caucus. So we're there and it was love in the room, black people loving each other. That was a major, that, that was, that was, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an experience that you write down. I'm glad my children were there. They got to see it. This is black politics. And they got to see two, two or three sides of it too. Because not only my children are there, the temple was there too. Okay. So you got, you know, Joey, you know, you got uh, King. These are people of other ethnicities. I'm like, check it, take a look at black politics. These senators are out there like this. <laughs> they out there shaking their ass to, to Tupac, okay? And you, you really get to see how real it really is. How real it really is. And, and it was a humbling experience. And so that was, that, that was last week, and I'm still even feeling the... The, the brunt of it, the, the residuals from it last week, because it's still online, people are still commenting uh, uh, on this as, as well. Um, and I'm just, you know, just, just, just taking it all in. But I mentioned all of this, uh, the, at least this, this part of it, to say that, you know, we have solutions. We have solutions. Leadership is about solutions. The Temple of Hip Hop is about solutions. Our gospel that we read every Sunday is about solutions. It's not just about pointing fingers. It's about solutions. And sometimes you have to also change your views and modify your views so that you can get to the solution. I'm not so much of an anti-voter anymore. I think I'm going to actually register to vote. And, 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 and take it a little more seriously. Now, of course, I'm not changing my view. <laughs> I might even write a scathing song <laughs> about voting on that level. Um, I got this song called Democracy. You got to check out. It's crazy, okay? Um, not changing my views. But yes, I am. I'm going to modify them. Why? Because I'm in front of the truth. And forget your views when you're in front of the truth. You're going to hold on. See, that's what too many people see. You know what it is. That's what they want to hold they, in front of the truth. You can't change your view. And you know this is the truth. And you holding on to your view. Nah, we don't do that here. We're learning here. I can always grow. Always be corrected. I can always see my errors and be like, yo, I was wrong. <laughs> Let me change that real quick uh, and get over here. That's what a temple is about. That's what this is about. This is not about judgment or anything to, 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 to that extent. This is about mercy, forgiveness, learning, stumbling. I was with Donnie McKirkland. Uh, we fall down, but we get up. You know how many lives he saved singing that? Oh, just that one, okay? Look up Donnie McKirkland if you don't know. He's a huge, uh, J um, I was going to say Jamaican artist. He probably is. Uh, a gospel artist. Um, legend in, in, in the gospel arena. Uh, huge songs. I, I love his voice and, and, and when I have all his stuff personally. So when I saw him at the at Black at the Black Caucus, we both had a fan moment, uh, real quick, uh, and, and just you know absorbed each other, it, you know. And another one of those Black Love moments as 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 well. It was dope. The minister, man before God, uh, he's a straight Christian minister, gospel music, a legend in the game. He knew exactly what it was with hip hop. We just came right in, boom, pound up to him. It was just, it was like we was one people. Uh, only separated by job and description and social title, but really in soul. We all one people. We was all one people. And and it was it was beautiful. Um so let's get into our study. Uh let's get into our study. Uh real quick, um the Stop the Violence movement, uh, we're collecting music uh and rhymes for that. I went in the studio 
and uh, voiced a, 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 a you know a beginning to a couple of songs um, as well. Uh, uh, actually, I need to get that to anyone who wants to um, be part of that. Um, I, I, I did mention, I'm looking at my notes here, and uh, let me give you Kid Capri's uh, uh, email address. No Kidding Records 07. That's N O K I D N R E C O R D S 07 at gmail.com. No Kidding Records 07 at gmail.com. That's where you send your music. And, and, and send um, any responses. Like if you managed to get uh, the song that I rhymed on, um, you can actually um, send it to Kid Capri directly, No Kidding Records. Uh, I was looking for our alternative email as well, but I'm gonna let that slide and get a little more organized. That's the, that's the central one right there. HipHop50Years.com hiphop50years.com is where you RSVP for August 11th, uh, 2023 for the opening of our Hip Hop 50 Years exhibition at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. You go to hiphop50years.com. That's H-I-P-H-O-P, -P, the number 50, Y-E-A-R-S.com. As I mentioned last week as well, Graph Writers hit up Desire One. She gave you her um, email address last week. Graph Writers hit up Desire One uh, if you want to be part of the beautifying of the Temple of Hip Hop. Um, as in addition to the exhibit, the Fifty Years exhibit, uh, and so on. There's a lot of there's a lot of artistic work here uh, to get done um, as as well. Um, okay, that uh, appears to be it. And like we said as well, I'm, I'm skipping over, this is my, my schedule here. I'm skipping over, um, um, like you already know, I'm doing Baltimore on the 24th, uh, the Hip Hop Alliance conference call, Black History Month conference call um, that um, happened yesterday. Uh, and uh, tonight I'm in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey uh, 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 tonight. So um, that's why I'm skipping over those. We're gonna leave for California. I'll get back to us next week. Uh, those who wanted to go to California, there was an email address as well with that as, as well. Those who are gonna join in on the apprenticeship uh, of that, we had an email address go up uh, for that. Uh, as as well, but I'm on my way to California now uh, to spread the word on the West Coast and uh, take in some information. I'm looking forward to meeting West Coast scholars and talk up 50 years on the West Coast, what was going on uh, and, and so on. I'm really looking forward to that. But we, um, th that's what it is. But I'm not getting into that right now. We are just going to go right in to our read. And so I'm holding the gospel of hip hop and I'm here with the third lesson. And like, like we, you heard us talk about citizenship, civility, civilization, society building. This is what this, is what this lesson is, is really all about. And, and why is this important? Well, it's not important for everyone. It's only important for those who are serious builders of, of, well, not only the temple of hip hop, but their own temple. Shout out to the Freemasons out there right now. Those who are building Solomon's temple, for real. Those who are actually brick by brick building themselves into a greater person. That's what this is for. This is not for everybody. This is for those who know they are chosen to do great things. And so others can be inspired by it, but this lesson is really for those who are the, the ascendants of civilization builders. Here, we're not just calling out the name of, of, of great ancestors and belittling their name by calling their name 
but not being able to do what they did or not being able to continue their work. Why call upon Malcolm X or have some sort of reverence for Malcolm X or Dr. King if you're not gonna continue their work? Why call their name or, or, or try to align yourself word-wise with a Marcus Garvey. You could quote Marcus Garvey, you could quote Booker T, you could quote Kwame Torre, but you'll never do their work. That's the objective approach to knowledge. We understand the objective approach. Some things you have to approach objectively, but hip hop is subjective. It's us. We feel it. You can't just study hip hop and not be hip hop. We are what we are studying knowledge of self, we're studying self. So in that, we don't call the name of Imhotep without building a pyramid. We don't call the name of whoever without doing their work. This is where we are right here as we reach the end of our gospel read, where you are supposed to be coming now an attuned hip hopper. You understand what's going on now, you're in line with the actual culture. This third lesson, I said last week, this third lesson is all about freedom within culture. I told you we was gonna talk about ethnicity and race and how as hip hoppers, we're going to have to recreate ourselves into a new people, black, white, brown, red, yellow, whatever ethnicity or race you claim today to be part of a hip hop nation, you're gonna have to rethink yourself, rethink your identity. Now, don't get me wrong, we about tradition here. So, you know, if you're white, love your white culture, your European culture. You black, love your black culture, your African culture. You uh, Asian, love your Asian culture, Persian, Arab, so on. Asian, you know, love you, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's the point, love you, and learn to love others that are not like you, learn to see the greatness in other people, see the Christ, namaskar, the Christ in me greets the Christ in you, that's, that's the angle, that's the mind state you have to come to, to read this now. And how ironic that I'm reading about race and, and really the illusion of it. As I accept the blackest award one can achieve at the Black Caucus. Just look at life. Look at this. <laughs> Just look at life. God, you're a comedian. I know you are. Okay. Okay. This is the week. Okay. That I get the Percy Sutton Lifetime Achievement Award from the Black Caucus, New York State Black Caucus. And here I am now, getting ready to tell you how race don't even matter. <laughs> okay, here we go, y'all, here we go. I'm on page 782 and I'm reading paragraph 377. I'm starting from paragraph 377. Okay, here we go. Like many world cultures, including the American popular culture, hip hop seems to be born from cult cultural syncretism, meaning the blending of different cultures to create a new culture. This is what makes hip hop an international, uh, this is what makes hip hop as an international culture possible. These are its origins, the ingredients of the culture. The concept of further developing a popular social movement into a sovereign community of specialized people is not new. And there is much research and many precedents to study from regarding this subject. Hip hop is the combination and unity of several independent cultures and subcultures creating a new heterogeneous culture. This happens often in world history. Old cultures give birth to new cultures. Older civilizations have even given birth to our present American civilization. Why treat hip hop any different when it is clearly experiencing it hip hop 
is clearly experiencing a similar historical reality in its present day as other great world civilizations have experienced at their genesis. The question is not whether hip hop is a culture or not. The question is, do we want it to be? Now, let's stop here because this is the first highlight. Um, and this, by the way, is also a prophecy fulfilled because when this particular piece was written, um, you notice that I'm still battling with others about whether hip hop is a culture or not. Try to remember that the gospel of hip, hip hop was written before anyone thought hip hop was a culture. Now today, it just seems like we all, or we all already thought it, and I'm with that too, okay? But this, for you to understand the gospel though, you gotta understand that the gospel was written in a time before people recognized hip hop as culture. So the question is not, the question was, the question is not whether hip hop is a culture or not. The question is, do we want it to be? And that was my response as others would say, hip hop's not a culture. Hip hop's not this, it's a music genre. It's this and that. And, and I said, well, the issue is not whether hip hop, whether hip hop is a culture or not. The issue is, do you want it to be? Because if you want it to be, it can be. It's, we're still waiting for somebody else to approve us or tell us we are culture. And that's just straight slave mentality. We ain't waiting for nobody to approve us or tell us who we are or why we are, even where we are. We tell ourselves this. The question is not whether hip hop is a culture or not. The question is, do we want to be? Can we actually govern ourselves? This is the key piece. Can we actually govern ourselves? Looking upon the cultural history of just this Western civilization, uh, of just this Western civilization in which we live, we can see how cultures are created and why. We can see how cultures are created and why. So highlight uh, 380. Moving on. Classical civilization was born from the wreckage of Cretan civilization in the period 1150 to 900 BC and Western civilization was born from the wreckage of classical civilization in the period 350 to 700 AD. And this is, you know, Greco, let's say classical Greece, Greco-Roman civilization, that collapsed, gave birth to Western civilization, which is, you know, America, Britain, France, really France, uh, Spain, uh, Britain, these kind of things. Um, you know, one culture collapses, one civilization collapses and gives birth to another one. As Carol Quigley, famous professor, by the way, as Carol Quigley explains in his book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time, Western, quote, <coughs> excuse me, quote, Western civilization began as all civilizations do in a period of cultural mixture. Did you hear that? Okay. Western civilization began as all civilizations do in a period of cultural mixture. You get this? Not one culture, not one race, not one bunch of cultures coming together and start mixing. Referring to the 350 to 700 AD invasion of barbarian tribes, upon the independent European societies of classical civilization, he continued, quote, and by the way, <clears throat> we went over that. Barbarian is everybody who doesn't speak Greek uh, and later Ro Ro Roman uh, or Latin uh, 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 back then, and then later on wasn't Christian. Uh, you were considered a barbarian. Uh, uh, basically everyone else. <laughs> um, Barbarian tribes upon the independent European societies of classical civilization. He continues, quote, by creating a new culture from the various elements offered from the barbarian tribes, the Roman world, Sarcasian world, and above all, the Jewish world, Christianity, Western civilization became a new society. 
Now look at what they say. Barbarians, black folk, and everybody that's not Greek and Roman. Um, the Romans, <laughs> them as well. Sarcasian, uh, the, the uh, uh, Saracen, Saracen world. Um, you know, Mediterranean and all of that. And above all, the Jewish world, which is, is Christianity, basically. Western civilization became a new society. And Judaism is not Christianity. But in, in the context of how one creates another, you know, Christianity comes out of Judaism. This is, this is the lineage of how cultures are created. He continues, quote, when one society is destroyed by the impact of another society, the people are left in a debris of cultural elements derived from their own shattered culture as well as the invading culture. These elements generally provide the instruments for fulfilling the material needs of these people. Here's, here's, the, here's the part. But they cannot be organized into a functioning society because of the lack of an ideology and a spiritual cohesive cohesiveness I would say but a spiritual cohesive I'm quoting the book this is the piece right here and when I read this some 25 years ago it it opened my eye as to why we have to have a temple for hip-hop before we start with can we govern ourselves we got to we got to know ourselves we got to have a spirit we got to have something outside of what this material world is is offering. We are like this group right here. We were invaded, shattered our culture, but also the invaded culture got shattered too. The invading culture got shattered as well. The invading culture got infected by what they invaded. You don't have intercourse with, with, with someone and don't get what they got. So they have intercourse with Africa <laughs> what you thought you was just raping? Nah, we got you too. And so at the end of the day, look at how societies are created. The invaded, the, the, it's not just one way colonialism. That's why colonialists and imperialists got to make you believe they the ones and the only ones because they're not. Their children are being affected as well. They got to keep putting their kids back in check. They got to keep beating their kids, keep lying to their kids because you got infected with the indigenous population too. And when you got there, it was good. And you was like, man, fuck this. I don't want my father's tradition. I want this Native American. They having the time of their life. I want this African right here. I want this Caribbean right here. I want this Boricua right here. You ain't looking at Europe no more. You ain't looking at wherever you came from and, and, and anymore. You want to be like this, but your European parents, according to colonialism, especially if you British, your British parents are like, no, this is the British way. This is what it is. And so many kids are rebelling now against that because to be honest with you, it wasn't right from the beginning. It wasn't right from the beginning. Invading people's homes, slavery, slavery, rape, kidnap. These things are not right. That means they can't last. But guess what? Even in evil, look how large. We've lost nothing. <laughs> okay? The only thing we lost was our mind. <laughs> That's about it. Regain that, you regain everything. Okay? With all that they did against us, we still here. We still here. And not only here, we flourishing. I'm not talking about just me. I'm talking about as a group. And I'm not just talking black. I'm talking about go through every ethnicity, every race. The downtrodden of that race is winning today. <laughs> go back. Look at any, look any race. I went to California. All the white folk gone. Black folk non-existent. Mexicans pushing big trucks. <laughs> Well-to-do Mexicans living in eight-bedroom mansions. What? They run California. Viva Mexico. No doubt. That's what it is for real. 
Ain't nobody struggling. At it. You know, you may, of course, they got the Mexican out there selling the oranges, okay? They got to be one or two out there on the highway. You know what it is. But I'm talking about the, the, the working class Mexicans are winning right now. Working class black folk winning right now. Working class white folk winning. Even though you get that rhetoric, you know, you will not replace us. Those are idiots. The whole economy for white folk is going up. That's the complaint. That we can't make the same dollar as white folk. And women can't even get the same dollar as the white man. So where's the complaint? What do you complain? Why? At least economically. So let's read on because we're showing here how society, how culture is created, how society comes together. And there are various ways in which society, this is not the only way, but the reason this is relevant is because we are the we are those we are these people. We are not the other way that society has been created or civilization comes up. We're not that other way. This is the way we are. We are victims of crime, imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, slavery. So when your society gets shattered, this is what the scholars of political science are saying because it, it happens often in world history we're not the only ones that experience this but there's a knowledge to this the game is not over just because you invade that don't mean game over just because you enslave don't mean game over here's the game after you've invaded now now look at this I'm going to read this part again because this is why I wanted to stop here because of this ideology and a spiritual cohesion. Let me hit you with it again. These elements, these shattered elements, generally provide the instruments for fulfilling the material needs of these people. Did you hear that? The material needs. When, the, when, your, when your society is invaded and shattered, these broken up pieces actually benefit you materially and the invading culture. Peace over here, peace over there, peace over there. Those with the pieces actually benefit. They actually get something out of this, which is why colonialism works, which is why imperialism works, because you could always find somebody not only willing to sell out, but the other person who, who has figured out how to manage disaster, how to win in a, in a, in a disastrous situation. Everybody's not going to just be whipped and enslaved. Everybody's not just going to die. Some people are going to benefit by this invasion and not sell out. It's not, a, it's not about sell out. This is science. This is, this is what happens if you drop a, a glass on the floor. It shatters. And where the pieces go either benefits those, you know, those pieces or not. You know, when it rains. Everybody don't benefit. Some do, some don't. Floods, as terrible as a flood is, somebody still benefit. So the elements generally provide the instruments for fulfilling the material needs of these people. And notice how you said elements, we call breaking them, seeing freedom and so on, our elements. And it has provided our material needs. Hip-hop made us rich. Hip-hop in lowercase. You know, rap and rap music product. And they got us some money. But that's all, that's all you get, though. <laughs> it fulfills your material needs. Now let's go on. But these elements, but they cannot be organized into a functioning society because of the lack of an ideology and a spiritual cohesive. There got to be an idea that unites us all. That's when I started saying, I am hip hop. Rap is something we do, hip hop is something we live. You are not just doing hip hop, you are hip hop. This forms ideology. 
Such people either perish or are incorporated as individuals and small groups into some other culture whose ideology they adopt for themselves and above all for their children. In some cases, however, the people left with the debris of a shattered culture are able to reintegrate their culture, their cultural elements into a new society and a new culture. So they're saying there's two kinds of people. When a society shatters, one type of people adopt themselves into the, the new, the, the, the invading culture. You look, white folk came in. If it's Spanish, I'm going to go ahead and go with the Spanish. If it's English, I'm going to go ahead and go with the English. If it's French, I'm going to go ahead and go with the French. In some cases, however, this is the other group. People are left with the debris of a shattered culture are able to reintegrate their culture, their cultural elements into a new society and a new culture. So your old culture got shattered. Boom! But then what did that do? It gave you pieces to take the same culture and rearrange it in a different way. Oh, you better hear me right now. God is faster than the devil. You're not, hear you're not hearing me right now. God is smarter than the devil. You thought you were invading. You thought you were raping. You thought you were shattering. What you were doing was reorganizing. You're not here. You're not. I need to leave this place right now because nobody's going to hear me. Okay? This is the truth. What really happened? was what happens in the universe. When a star gets old, it dies and explodes, creating new stars that go on. And this is the process of the universe. Why would culture be any different? Why would culture be any different? You think you're operating out of um, greed and wanting resources. You think that's what it is. But what you're really doing is giving me an opportunity to reorganize my house. It's like living in your house and, and a fire breaks out. And it don't destroy the house, but it's fire, it's smoke, you ruined a room. Well, now I got an opportunity with this insurance money to remodel my whole joint. Okay, the fire was a sad situation. The flood ruined everything. But now I got an opportunity to redo my house. And this is what culture is all about. Reintegrate their cultural elements into a new society and a new culture. This is political science too, by the way. I'm reading from one of the most um, important political science books in political science history. That's why it's here. Carol Quigley uh, tragedy and hope. You ask any political science major about this book, they will definitely have a comment on it. That's why we're reading from it. But there are other books that exemplify the same thing and go even deeper. This is just how we are um, articulating our argument for a new civilization. Continuing at 384. Uh, and, and, and I'm off, I'm not quoting anymore. We're back to the gospel. When I read this, I am encouraged because this means that there is precedence for what we are proposing for hip hop. Hip hop is a new world culture. Uh, hip hop as a new world culture is very possible because our existence is the natural result of historical traceable events. Wow, you know what's interesting about this? Again, I'm speaking at a time when hip-hop as a culture was not perceived. So look at how it's written. Hip-hop as a new world culture is very possible. <laughs> it's very possible because our existence is the natural result of historical traceable events. I'm still trying to convince scholars and others that we can be a culture. That's, and it's, it's irrelevant today because it is what it is. But look at the work that had to be done to get us there. And the gospel is documenting it, actually, in this read. 
Um, it's not the point of the read, but as we go, we, we can see what's happening here. What other civilizations have achieved in a thousand years, we can achieve in 100. Times are indeed different today. The question is, do we want to seize upon this unique opportunity? Quickly speaks of cultural elements being created when one society is destroyed by the impact of another society. This points to a good portion of the African-American community. He writes, quote, the people are left in a debris of cultural elements, end quote. This resembles very accurately part of the origin of our African-American, Latino, and Afro-Caribbean cultural elements coming together to form breaking, MCing, graffiti art, DJ and beatboxing, etc., which we derive from our own shattered African uh, cultures as well as from the invading European cultures. For the hip hop community, the most interesting part of Mr. Quigley's statement is when he points out that, quote, these elements generally provide the instruments for fulfilling the material needs of these people, but they cannot be organized into a functioning society because of the lack of an ideology and a political uh, and a spiritual cohesion. This is hip hop's present state right here. Our elements provide the uh, our elements provide the instruments for fulfilling our material needs money, property, prestige, credit, etc. But they cannot be organized into a functioning society because of the lack of an ideology and a spiritual cohesion. This is clear. You can have all the money in the world, but if you have, you can have all the money in the world, but if you hold no strong principles, no lasting traditions, no respect for the creed and vision of your own ancestors, you are still politically a slave, a victim of war, conquest, and other past traumatic events. You still have no foundation yet because you still have never actually recovered from the experiences of war and conquest. Even with money, the unprincipled, uncultured person is still not free. Until you create yourself, you are not yet truly free, even with money, power, and respect. Culture doesn't grow on trees. It grows in free minds and is released through free human actions. Human beings choose their cultures. Cultures do not choose them. However, the relationship between culture and humanity is indeed more complex than this. It is we who create cultures and civilizations, but in turn, the culture and, and civilized societies that we create do in fact create us. Take the United States of America as, an, as another example. In the beginning, there were no American people. As Joseph J. Ellis, another very famous author on history, a historian, and that's why also keep in mind that these names are in the book. This is why their names are in the book, because for further study, you should grab these books and, and further read them yourself. You should look up these authors and see the other works that they have as well. That's also why I'm quoting them in this book. But here, as Joseph J. As, as Joseph J. Ellis explains in the CD series of his book, Founding Brothers, quote, in the beginning, there were no American people. The Constitution's purpose was to provide a framework to gather together the scattered strands of the population into a more coherent collective worthy of that de designation. Mr. Ellis continues, the point, the point requires a reflective review of recent scholarship on the complicated origins of American statehood. Based on what we now know, <laughs> of the Anglo-American connection in the pre-revolution era, this is all American history, that is, that is before it was severed. L let me read that one more time. Based on what we now know of the Anglo-American connection in the pre-revolution era, that is before it was severed, before America declared its independence, uh, to Britain, when, when it was actually Britain, when it was Anglo-Saxon in, in America, okay, before anybody was called an American, is what, it, what, what they're, they're suggesting here. 
the initial before all of that, the initial identification of the colonial population as Americans came from English writers who use the term negatively as a way of referring to a marginalized or peripheral population unworthy of equal status with full-blooded Englishmen. Back at the metropolitan center of the English empire, the word American was uttered and heard as an insult that designated an inferior or insubordinate people like nigger. The, the entire thrust of the colonist justification, wait a minute, let me stop here, like nigger, my nigger. Look at this, the word American, I quote, by the way, okay, I'm quoting Joseph J. Ellis's book, or the CD series of his book, Founding Brothers, talking about early American history and the origins of America. He's telling us right here, the word America was equivalent to the word nigger or any other derogatory term that you give to a marginalized, subordinate, peripheral people. This is his words right here. Let me continue. Quote, the entire thrust of the colonist justification for independence was to reject that designation, American on the grounds that they possessed all the rights of British citizens. And the ultimate source of these rights did not lie in any indigenous origins, but rather in a transcendent realm of national rights, alleged, allegedly shared by all men everywhere." End quote. In the pre-revolution days, before there really was an America or an American, 16% of the colonial population were Tories, meaning that they were loyal to the British crown. When rebellion began to break out all over the colonies and elsewhere, the Tories fled to Canada and others back to England. Thomas Paine, author of the historical pamphlet Common Sense, who helped to cause the American Revolution against Britain, was actually British himself. In their famous writings, the, uh, the Lessons of History, philosophers Will and Ariel Durant direct us to, quote, consider the origin of the great peoples and civilizations of history, how nearly every one of them began with the slow mixture of varied racial stocks entering from, a, enter, entering from any direction into some conquered or inviting region, mixing their blood in marriage or otherwise, gradually producing a homogeneous people and thereby creating, so to speak, the biological basis of a new civilization. So the Egyptians were formed of the Ethiopians, Libyans, Ar uh, 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 of the, of the uh, let me read this again. So the Egyptians, were formed of the Ethiopians, Libyans, Arabs, Syrians, and Mesopotamians. Let me read that one more time. So the Egyptians were formed of the Ethiopians, Libyans, Arabs, Syrians, and Mesopotamians. So the ancient Hebrews were composite of their own various stocks and of Canaanites, Edomites, Moabites, Ammonites, Hittites, and a dozen other peoples that swirled around the Euphrates, the Jordan, and the Anorantes rivers. The Durants continue. Varied, sto varied stocks entering some locality from diverse directions and diverse times mingle their blood, traditions, and ways with one another or the existing population like two diverse pools of genes coming together in sexual reproduction. Such an ethnic mixture may in the course of centuries produce a new type, even a new people. So Celts, Romans, Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Stains, and Normans fused to produce Englishmen. When the new type takes form, 
its cultural expressions are unique and, const and, and, and constitute a new civilization's new physiog physiognomy, character, language, literature, religion, morality, and art. It is not the race that makes the civilization. It is the civilization that makes the people. Did you hear this? Circumstances, geographical, economic, and political, create a new culture, and the culture creates a new human type. But in the final analysis, uh, end quote, but in the final analysis, it is the human mind that perceives its civilization and declares uh, uh, and decides to adopt it and develop it. This is where hip hop comes into our study. Now, let me stop here for a minute. And uh, cause I've been talking for a while. I'm gonna take a break real quick. I want you to contemplate this real quick because this is where we begin to really think about what is race? What is ethnicity? What is it really? According to every political scientist, race is, is something you decide upon. It's a choice. You, you are, it's a social title you choose to identify yourself through to function in society. But is it real? And, and we're talking here about the creation of culture, the creation of race. And what is being pointed out here, this is uh, the philosophers William and Ariel Durant, look them up too. They mention here that it is not the race, and come on, let, let's, let's go ahead and underline that. Let's go ahead and underline that. It is not the race that makes the civilization. It is the civilization that makes the people. Keep going. Circumstances, geographical, economic, and political create a new culture, and the culture creates a new human type. That is the point. Contemplate that for a minute. I'll be right back. Wanna know we're on the scene. They promote rappers that contradict Dr. King's dream. These acts are deliberate, they part of the same scheme. Cop shot the kid, I still hear him scream. This ain't funny, so don't you dare laugh. Just straight and narrow, or you will not last. Slip Rick told y'all, good night. Turn it up! Knock him out the box, Chris. Out the box, Chris. Knock him out the box, Chris. Out the box, Chris. Knock him out the box, Chris. Knock him out the box, Chris. This already. Grillo, no! Get this shit, bro. A sellout, I am not this. Pull out and pop this. Revolutionary topic, right over the hot shit. Video is for your optics, that's why you watch it. But it can become hypnotic if you cannot stop it. Your mind, you must unlock it from their phony topics. Focus on the truth, with proof, use your logic. Words are like character, purpose. You got it or got them? Invisible forces, can you spot them? The blind continues to lead the blind to the bottom. Destroying their city like Gamora and Sodom. I rock them with truth, cause knowledge reigns supreme. Cop shot the kid, I still hear him scream. This ain't funny, so don't you dare. Just another. 
straight and narrow or you will not last. Slick Rick told y'all good night. Knock him out the bus, Chris. Out the bus, Chris. Welcome back. So in our, in, our, in our last break, I just ended off with this. I want to read it one more time because I want you to underline it. I'm at paragraph 396 and I'm at the end of it. So sort of like the toward the end of, of, of the, uh, the paragraph, actually the end of the paragraph itself, the last two lines of the paragraph itself. Here, here's what it is. It is not the race that makes the civilization. It is the civilization that makes the people Circumstances, that is the peace. Situations and circumstances. This is the God part of it. This is the universal mind part of it. Circumstances. Things that happen outside of your control, but they're happening. Circumstances, geographical, economic, and political create a new culture and the culture the culture creates a human type end quote but in the final analysis it is the human mind that perceives its civilization and decides to adopt it and develop it this is where hip-hop comes into our study this is now after reading this political science piece at the beginning here we're now coming into how does this apply to us? I'm on paragraph 397. Yes, it is the civilization that makes the people, but as we can see, it is the activity of a people that further creates civilization. Hip hop has already created us. The questions, are, the questions now are, are we further creating hip hop? And what does it mean to be hip hop? The hip hop experience has, has already created a new human type in the world, but are we willing to accept and most of all adopt such a type as our own? Let's, let's highlight the whole 398. The whole of 398, this is the next page. We're gonna highlight this and here's why. And as a matter of fact, you could put as a note, the meaning of citizenship. The meaning of citizenship. This is what we are talking about today. Been talking about all week. Highlight 398. Today, being hip hop means that you are willing to adopt hip hop's ideals as a major part of your own cultural identification, creating a new human type in the world. It means that you are ready to tell a new story about yourself and your history, creating a new human group. It means that you are free to recreate yourself. This story is common to America's immigrant history. Immigrants, immigrants rarely forget where they have come from, but they, we, incorporate the best of our past into the best expectations of our newly created future when we assimilate into any new country. Highlight that whole thing. Yes, I am more than proud of my African and African-American heritage. Let me read that again correctly. Yes, I am more than proud of my African and American heritage, heritages. I am grateful to be part of such a story in world history, and that's the truth. However, when thinking critically about, well, let me stop here for a minute. Um, let me walk you through this piece because you got to underline this. This is the mission of our temple. This is called the mission of our temple. 399, the mission of our temple. But you're not highlighting it. You're going to underline it. Here's, here's what we're going to do. Now, follow me here. However, when thinking critically about right there where you see the, you're going to put a number one and underline the restoration of our lost civilizations. Underline that. Put a one in front of the and underline that. Then after civilizations, put a two and underline the enhancement of our present quality of life. After life, put three 
than underline the preservation of hip hop's artistic elements. Then put a four after elements and underline freedom from negative corporate exploitation. Then put a five and underline and a hip hop way of life rooted in peace and prosperity. So you should be seeing one, two, three, four, five points to the mission of our temple. So now I'll read it through. However, when critically thinking, oh, I'm sorry, let me read the whole paragraph. Yes, I am more than proud of my African and American heritages. I am grateful to be part of such a story in world history. However, when thinking critically about the restoration of our lost civilizations, the enhancement of our present quality of life, the preservation of hip hop's artistic elements, freedom from negative corporate exploitation, and a hip hop way of life rooted in peace and prosperity, everything we collectively discussed at our hip hop conferences and summits, basically this was the gist of it, it becomes apparent that we are going to have to become a new type of people all together if we are to actually achieve such a quality of living. And I am not exaggerating here. To achieve higher states of freedom and liberty and finally claim what is rightfully ours, self-governance, we are going to have to create a new culture and lifestyle from the debris of our shattered cultures capable of achieving the goals that we say we want for ourselves and for our children. We are going to have to become the civilization that we desire to see. We are going to have to recreate ourselves and to do that, we must know ourselves, not just on a spiritual level, but on a cultural and even genetic level. Yes, spiritual cohesiveness is an important part it is, is an important part in the building of our hip hop civilization. It is the foundation. But how we interpret our spiritual cohesion and the tools we use to discover ourselves cannot be based solely upon the opinions and interpretations of those whose intentions are and were to exploit us and our resources. We, as a hip hop people, have to do what Abraham was instructed to do in Genesis chapter 12. Quote, get thee out of thy country and form thy kindred, uh, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will shew thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. End quote. This is why we question the whole idea of establishing one's eth ethnic identity based upon a landmass or upon the pigmentation of one's skin or upon the language one speaks. Many of us are still defining ourselves based upon the opinions and commercial interests of others who use outdated techniques, disproven views, and broken methodologies to understand human identity. For the sake of our very survival, growth, and development as hip hoppers, I think it is time for a few of us to rethink our ethnicities as well as the very concept of race itself. Some of us hip hoppers need to become serious, critical race theorists. And I'm sorry for using that word if it offends anyone. This book was written many years before this became an issue. Hip hoppers need to become serious, critical race theorists and stop relying upon the assumptions and opinions of others regarding the origins of race and ethnicity. Ian F. Haney Lopez explains in his book, White by Law, The Legal Construction of Race, quote, of late, a new strand of legal scholarship dedicated to reconsidering the role of race in in U.S. society has emerged. Writers in this genre, known as critical race theory, have for the most part shown an acute awareness of the socially constructed nature of race. Much critical race theory scholarship recognizes that race is a legal construction. 
Quoting John Calmore, Mr. Lopez continues, quote, critical race theory begins with a recognition that race is not a fixed term. Instead, race is a fluctuating, decentered complex of social meanings that are formed and transformed under the constant pressure of political struggle. Critical race theory increasingly acknowledges the extent to which race is not an independent given on which the law acts, but rather a social construction, at least in part fashioned by law. So, so, well, let me fin finish, end quote. Ultimately, it is the courts that have created and further created our modern understanding of race, not based upon scientific evidence, but based upon common knowledge, what people believe. This you got to realize. Now, remember, the books that I'm quoting, you can get these and further your knowledge into what we're dealing with here. The people that I'm speaking, the authors that I'm speaking about here, these are the foremost scholars on this particular subject. And as you can see, God is always ahead because critical race theory was not a big deal. Even in 2009, when this book was published, okay, but we're writing even before that, okay, critical race theory wasn't the point. But God knew in the future that we were going to have to educate our people on this particular point. Because remember, critical race theory is in this book not to explain critical race theory, <laughs> but to explain how races are created. So to get to how races are created, we had to deal with critical race theory. So we're dealing with critical race theory. And critical race theory is saying that race is not a fixed thing. Race was created by law. And what is the law going by? The law is not going by science or anything like that. Any, no empirical data, no, no, no fact. The law is going by what people believe and really what white people believe only. That, that's what becomes the law. And we can see this played out across a lot of laws. What is law? What white folk believe? Is that really law? We have our section down by law. We went through law. Go back. Let's go back and look at that one. We went all through law and what law is and why it's important. Here we're not dealing really with law. We're dealing with what white, what the white population believes. And it that belief becomes law. Continuing, I'm on paragraph 404. For many years in the United States, race was scientifically determined by certain human distinctions pertaining to the shape of the skull, distinct complexion differences, and hair textures. Early editions of Webster's Dictionary cite Professor of Medicine Johann F. Blumenbach, another one. These names, okay, remember these names. Johann uh, uh, Frederick Blumenbach's classification of races. One, the Caucasian. You know that got to be first, right? Uh, one, the Caucasian or white race to which belong the greater part of European nations and those of Western Asia. <laughs> Two, the Mongolian or yellow race occupying Tartary, China, Japan, etc. Three, the Ethiopian or Negro, black race occupying all of Africa except the North, which they colonize. And South America, and is it, uh, uh, North, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I skipped over, uh, uh, except the North. Fourth, the American or red race containing the Indians of North and South America. Now stop here real quick. Notice how back, this is, this is going back to the 1800s. He said the American, okay? And, and what is the American? The red race. And, and what are we talking about? The Indians of North and South America. Basically, they're all the indigenous people of this, this land mass. 
Okay, but look at the look at the distinction because we just talked about that in England, in Britain, in the 1600s, 1800s, to be called an American was to be associated with these niggas. Okay, and he had Native Americans. They were the other niggas, remember? Okay, to be associated with, uh, to be called an American, you was associated with either Negroes or Indians. And this is carried over in Webster's definition. I'm reading from like an 1800 dictionary. And, 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 and we see here it says, for the American or red race. So they're trying to diss the, they're trying to diss the, 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 the Native American. They're trying to diss the Indian. They're trying to diss the, the original inhabitants of this land by calling them American. But God is so great that what they did was just put the, they put the true name of those people on those people. Look how the devil is a liar and the lie is used as the truth. You didn't see this? You don't see it. American. Now, years later, everybody said, I'm American. The American people. No, you're incriminating yourself. The true Americans are the Native Americans who were black people. Who were black people. These are the true Americans. Hip-hop is just bringing it back now. Hip-hop is coming into itself. Hip-hop is coming into a knowledge of itself. We're going back to the powwow. Hmm. So four, the American or red race containing the Indians of North and South America. And five, the Malay or brown race occupying the islands of the Indian archipelago, etc. Uh, that's out of uh, Fiji Islands. Um, uh, what they call um, uh, Melanesia, Polynesia. Well, Polynesia is the, the whole region. Um, but there's little, there's, there's little islands in French Polynesia, uh, uh, Melanesia, and there's all these little islands, Fiji, uh, all these little islands in, in there. These are straight black people. These are colonists dicing us up into different groups so they can have control of the land and resources. But basically, this was uh, uh, Johann Frederick Blumenbach's classification of races that was the, this was considered science. This was the science of the day. Now, end quote to Webster, continuing. These racial distinctions were used as part of a larger scientific view of the world's races and their characteristics. Remember, science can be tainted by racism too, even up to this very day. However, in an effort to settle immigration and naturalization cases, Brought before the courts in 1909, Mr. Lopez explains that, quote, a schism appeared among the courts over whether common knowledge or scientific evidence was the appropriate standard. Therefore, the lower courts divided almost evenly on the proper test for whiteness, then a requirement for U.S. citizenship. Hold on. My, my stomach can't take that. I had to belch that up. Hold up. I just had to. I just I had to pause on that. Come on in. No doubt. We're just finishing this up uh, right here. So just just grab seats. So so yeah, I had to pause for a minute uh, because you know again, look at this part right here. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, the lower courts divided almost evenly on the proper test for whiteness. So these are the courts. This is the law. And to be a U.S. citizen, like this was, whiteness was a requirement to be a U.S. citizen, to be a full-fledged U.S. citizen. Basically, they were only accepting white people. I mean, think about that. And, and most of these white people are immigrants. We read about this too. They're coming from all types of different other people, but coming into the U.S. and degrading the indigenous population already here. Negroes, Indians, 
other white folk that were here as well, they dissing everybody. This immigrant population of Europeans and, and others that are coming in and rearranging the laws. What is the law? What white folk think? Which white folk? The immigrant class coming in, forming this new thing called America or American. And imagine the original American was the Negro and the Indian, and it was said derogatorily. But now that we brought the term American into prominence, not everybody want to take our term from us. Sounds familiar? This sounds just like hip hop. Hip hop used to be looked down upon. This is a fad. That ain't nothing. Ain't no culture. It ain't nothing. Now we brought honor and respect to our name. And now everybody want to claim it now. And said he was all raised down. And, yeah, no. Remember me? America was the same way. To be called an American was, was a derogatory thing until we lifted it up. Now it's the American people. This is knowledge, and this is what knowledge does for you. It shows you how to navigate yourself through this world. It shows you what the real is from what the fake is. What cause is from what effect is. What right is from what wrong is. This is what knowledge is supposed to give you. So... Six courts relied on common knowledge, while seven others based their racial determinations on scientific evidence. And you see what the scientific evidence was, right? Okay. No court used both uh, 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 rationales. Over the course of two cases heard in 1922 and 1923, the Supreme Court broke the impasse in favor of common knowledge. So the Supreme Court decided some courts was like common knowledge. Other courts was scientific evidence. But in 1922 and 1923, the Supreme Court broke the impasse in favor of common knowledge. What white folk think? Though the courts did not see their decision in this light, the early congruence of and subsequent contradiction between common knowledge and scientific evidence set the terms of a debate about whether race is a social construction or a natural occurrence. In those terms, the Supreme Court's elevation of common knowledge as the legal meter of race convincingly demonstrates that racial categorization finds its origins in social practices, end quote. This is very important for the hip hop nation to understand. Yes, we may feel a certain loyalty to our individual races, but in fact, such loyalty is more, more a habit of familiarity. As Mr. Lopez's work points out further, quote, race is not a measured fact, but a preserved fiction. The celebration of common knowledge and the repudiation of scientific evidence show that race is a matter not of physical difference, but of what people believe about physical difference. Race is nothing more than what society and law says it is, end quote. So if we hip hoppers continue to accept the notion of individual races of human beings to define ourselves, we also accept the arbitrary characteristics and social statuses designated to individual races of human beings according to the non-scientific opinions of the courts. Free yourself now. Free yourself from such prejudiced interpretations of your very being. No one can define you except you. That's a fact. And the definitions you give yourself about yourself create the reality you perceive and presently live within. Legally, I am an American citizen, which because of my blackness and its direct association with Africa makes my legal political description in the United States African-American. 
And the collective African-American consciousness creates for itself a collective habitual behavior complete with its own history, traditions, beliefs, rituals that manifest certain collective experiences which affects the development of my individual life directly and daily. As long as I pledge my allegiance to the African-American identity, I experience a certain African-American reality, even legally. However, it is my human energy that makes the identity of African-American exist, not the other way around. It is my spiritual faith, my intellectual perceptions, and my physical body that make the identity of African American exist. I am telling myself that I am this or that, that I am African American, African, American, a black man, Negro, etc. I can equally tell myself that I am hip hop and it shall be so. The description of African American brings with it certain conditions that directly affect my well-being. Therefore, if I am truly free and still, excuse me, therefore, if I am truly free and still cannot seem to live the quality of life I expect for myself as an African American, I have the unalienable right and ability to change my cultural to change my cultural political identity to fit the path of my total well-being. What says that I must remain African American when such a distinction cannot enhance my well-being in the way I expect and respect? Respectfully, I ask, what is an, what is an African American? Is this distinction an accurate depiction of my being? Did I name myself African-American or was I born into this distinction? A distinction that brings with it real conditions to my physical being and reality. The question which, become, the, the, the question which comes to mind here is, do I think with my skin or do I think with my mind? What defines me when it comes to the nature of my being? Am I black? Or am I human? And of course, this line of thinking is not for everyone. There are many who may never truly understand what I am implying here. Just keep that in mind. But if I really want something different for myself, a different reality, I am going to have to adopt a new name, nature, that is better equipped to satisfy my immediate needs and offers my children a stronger future. I need a new name, a new nature, a new ethnic identity. I need a new culture. And hip hop provides for me exactly what I need today to survive as a father, a man, and most of all, a human being. And let me be clear here, creating a new hip hop civilization upon the earth is not a task that, a task that everyone can be involved in. Only some of us can do this. It will take it will take only a few of us to create a new world civilization. The question is, am I black or am I human? Are you white or are you human? Are you Asian, Hindu, native, Latino, Hispanic, etc.? Or are you human? Highlight in paragraph 411. We're going to highlight the whole 411 and you're going to see why. Here's 411. This is the true revolution in my time. This is a true change in our political situation. As the old saying goes, if you, all, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always gotten. In order to achieve the restoration of our lost civilization, the enhancement of our present quality of life, the preservation of artists, our artistic elements, freedom from negative corporate exploitation, and a hip-hop way of life rooted in peace and prosperity, we are going to have to totally rethink our group identity. We are going to have to tell a different story about us and our activity in the world so that our children may experience a totally different reality than the one we are presently living 
uh, today. Highlight that whole thing. Paragraph 412. I find it a bit hypocritical to first protest against racism in words and then turn around and cling to the concept of race in deeds. If we are to ever eradicate racism from the minds of our children, we are going to have to think and act beyond the confinement of race and racial distinctions. If we are truly serious about peace, love, unity, about peace, love, and the unity of all people, we are going to have to place our humanity above our individual skin colors. And hip-hop has the ability and opportunity to do just that. As, free -thinking human as a free-thinking human being, the question that I ask of myself are, the questions that I ask of myself are, is the traditional African-American lifestyle my actual lifestyle. And I say the traditional African-American lifestyle, if there is such a thing. Is that my lifestyle? I respect this lifestyle highly, but did I create this style of life for myself? Is this cultural lifestyle and racial distinction even healthy for me? What sustains my well-being and that of my children? Is it the African-American identity or is it hip hop? And seriously, you have to think about this. This is why this type of lesson is not for everybody because you have to seriously ask yourself, what is paying your bills? Is African-American paying your bills or some sort of activity or an African-American experience or talent or something? Is this paying your bills? Is this making you happy? Are you fulfilled? Can you define yourself and find fulfillment in whatever your ethnicity is? African American, you know, Asian American, you know, Europe, European American, um, whatever, okay? Are you happy with that? And this is a question many of us don't even ask ourselves because we, some of us find it offensive, some of us just ain't even thinking about it, but take time this Sunday right now, just take a moment and really think about, is my race, what I perceive myself as racially, is it helping me? Is it actually helping me? Race. And when I look at it, I say this honestly, African-American did help me. I can't front. African-American is some deep shit and it did help me, knowledge-wise. Most of my knowledge is African-American. It's geared toward that. I speak to those people. This is where I'm, I'm African-American. My experience is African-American. But when you have mastered your African-American identity, you arrive at hip hop, period. It ain't one or the other. It's the highest level of African-American mind, at least for my time, is hip hop. I don't know any other thing that the African-American community has produced at its heights other than hip hop. Like we do have good sport. We have great athletes, they hip hop. We have brilliant um, teachers and professors. The most brilliant African-American professors are hip hop. Shout out to Dr. Cornell West, Michael Eric Dyson, blah, 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 and all the others, okay? I don't wanna do name dropping here, but just give you an example. African-American enlightenment, African-American unity, African-American wealth and finance, hip-hop. So we're not dissing no African-American. We know that's the tradition. But we are thinkers. We are African-American thinkers. And so we're thinking, are we really African-American? Or was that put on us? Sure, we know what the title means and we respect it. But we are civilization builders. Before we were even called African, we were civilization builders. We could call ourselves whatever we want. 
And what we're teaching here is that what you call yourself has effects on you. So is African American working for you? Is the question. If it is, enhance those parts that's working for you. But if it's not, I invite you to hip hop because that's working for us. This is what's working for us. So we're imparting our gift, our prosperity onto you if you could comprehend this. So, so I just want to read this part one more time. One more time. 412, this is about our children. I find it a bit hypocritical to first protest against racism in words then turn around and cling to the concept of race in deeds. If we are to ever eradicate racism from the minds of our children, we are going to have to think and act beyond the confinement of race and racial distinctions. If we are truly serious about peace, love, and the unity of all people, we are going to have to place our humanity above our individual skin colors. And hip hop has the ability and opportunity, that's the key word, opportunity to do that. As free thinking human being, as a free thinking human being, the question that I ask of myself are, is the traditional African American lifestyle my, Afri my actual lifestyle? I respect this lifestyle highly, but did I create this lifestyle, this style of life for myself? Is this cultural lifestyle and racial distinction even healthy for me? What sustains my well-being and that of my children? Is it the African American identity or is it the hip or is it hip hop? And those who do not live, eat and survive by way of hip hop may be exempt from this line of questioning. But for those of us who are hip hop and have our being in hip hop, we must ask these questions seriously. Technically, I have a so-called West Indian heritage on my father's side. So why am I not exclusively claiming Trinidadian or afro Barbados as my ethnicity? Why do I not feel like a Trini connected to the struggles of my Trini people? Big up the Trinidad too, by the way. Um, yes, I feel some allegiance to the struggles of all black people, but I am trained or educated to the struggles of the African American in particular. And the key word here is trained. In fact, most African Americans are genetically linked to Native Americans. So why am I not claiming a Native American heritage? I, along with millions of other African Americans, have a European genealogy as well. Why do I not consider myself white? Let's just get right to it, okay? If I really wanted to be a white man, I could prove that to you. I could come up with something and prove to you right now I'm a white man. In fact, you think I'm playing with you, right? All right, I'm going to prove to you right now I'm a white man. This side right here is black. But if I flip my hand over right here, what color is this? This is not black. This don't even match. And first of all, let me show you like this. Okay. Does that match? Is this the same color? No, it's not. This is the color of white people. The palm of your hand, you can put this up against a white face. And it will match based on, of course, skin pigmentation and the whiteness of the other person and blah, 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 blah. But here, black people, look at the palm of your hand. This is white. This is the white complexion and the palms of your feet. Now, if you really want to bug out with me real quick, okay, talk some real philosophy real quick. We just bug out, theorize. Okay, if you want to theorize with me real quick, let me give it to you like this. So we're all taught, and I'm just going to deviate for a minute. We're all taught that Africa is the mother of civilization, of humanity itself, okay? But there is this theory called the aquatic ape theory. Now, this, so I can't get into this. This is not our lecture. So I'm going to breeze over some stuff. You got out of Africa theory. You have... Um, 
monogenetic theory or uh, uh, what is called genetic continuity theory. I'm, I'm botching these up, but I'm going to explain them to you right now. Out of Africa theory means that all of humanity evolved out of Africa. That the first human is out of Africa. Okay, that's why it's called the out of Africa theory. That all of humanity immersed out of Africa, was born in Africa, and then went traveling around the world. That's the dominant theory today. The other theory, multi-regional continuity. That's what it's called. Multi-regional continuity or monogenetic theory too in France. Th this theory says humans sprang up in different places around the world, not one human in Africa and then we went around, but that humanity sprang up in different pockets of the world and that's how humanity actually rises. We are supposed to be beings that lived in trees Start off as vegetarians, we're eating fruits, vegetables, and nuts. We're really eating nuts and insects off the trees. We are an ape-like being. Some say lizard-like being. We're supposed to come from the reptilian uh, line. So you get this aquatic ape theory. And the aquatic ape theory says that we came out of water. That we were not just in trees, but that there was a species of ape that came out of water. The first humans are said to even be fish. Meaning that when you look at the, the, the pregnancy of a woman, actually when you look at the birth really of a child, Humans seem to go through every kind of stage of reptilian until it gets to this. If you look at the birth, how, how humans become, we start off like frogs, like tadpoles. In fact, sperm is like a little tadpole. And then we come out, we look like a frog, like, or like what's called tadpoles. We don't become frogs, we become something else, like chickens. You look at a sperm, we look like a chicken. We look like a bird. Then we look, like fish, we look like fish, birds, this and that. And then it becomes this monkey kind of ape thing starts to happen. Now there's a theory that says that the first apes came out of water. The theory goes on to say that if in fact you are a, a water creature, an amphibian, First, you only breathe in water. Then somewhere along the line, you become water and air. So if you first deep in the water, your skin ain't black. Your skin is white or green or blue. These are the colors of creatures in the sea. You're not brown. This is because of the sun. You got to be on land to get this. Okay? So if you go with the aquatic ape theory, the first humans were white. You're a sea creature. You're white. You come out the water. There's no melanin yet. You come out the water. And black people know when you've been in water too long, don't your skin start turning white? Okay? Now, you come out the water, you walking on all fours on the water. The sun beating you down. So as the sun start baking you, you walking on all fours, what's the part of your body that doesn't get the sun? Whatever part of your body is not getting the sun is going to reveal what, your, what the other part of your body must have looked like. The part of your body that's not getting the sun if you're walking on all fours is the palms of your hand and the palms of your feet. They are the complexion of white people. Now, I know I'm bugging you out right now. I know I know it's the truth, but this is theory, okay? This is just theory. <laughs> this is just theory. 
But I want to take your mind to another place. Don't just sit there and say, oh, it's out of Africa. Yeah, Africa's the mother of civilization. Okay, we can deal with it. There's a bunch of evidence. And like I said, the out of Africa theory is the dominant theory that everybody's going with. But okay, put that in its place. Can we think over here for a minute? Can, can we come over here for a minute and start looking here at the palm of the head? Black people are white and black. <laughs> you got black on one side, white on the other. How that happen? Everybody else is the, the whole thing is, is what it is. White people, why? You know, the whole thing is what it is. But the, the darker you get, for some reason, the palms of your hands and the palms of your feet, which would have been an ancient something, walking on all fours, getting burnt out. By the way, too, if you're in water, your hair is straight. There's no kinky hair in water. There's no reason for it. You can't even move around. You'll get eaten. <laughs> a big ass afro in the water. <laughs> no, that's not good. You need wavy hair. You moving. Okay, you need straight hair. Now, if you had straight hair and you was white and you came out the ocean, sun hitting you, you getting this melanin on you now. You getting vitamin D on you now. Your hair gonna start that uh, the the your stringy hair gonna shrivel up, coil up. That's us. So is the black man the original man, or is the white man <laughs> the original man? You got to be willing to accept the truth. Wherever it leads you. Knowledge. Wherever it leads you. Don't get caught up on one thing. That ain't learning. You use knowledge. Like the way you go shopping at a supermarket. I can use this. I can use a little of that. Take the seasoning over here. Make your meal. The supermarket got a whole bunch of stuff in it. Like colleges. Universities and temples. Got all kinds of knowledge in it. But what kind of meal are you making with your mind? That's what you got to know. What kind of meal are you going to make for your mind? And so you think about this. So that's what we're talking about here. Let's let's get with this. Let me finish the read. I diverted for a minute. But just to stretch you out real quick. The original man is the white man. <laughs> oh, this is crazy. Here we go. So now I'm over here. At 414, okay, 414, 414, um, paragraph 4, 414, uh, hold on, let me make sure, right, yes, yes, that's where I'm at, but for those of us who are hip-hop, I'm going to read this again, for those of us that are hip-hop and have our being in hip-hop, we must ask these questions seriously, technically, I have a so-called, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I, 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 I read all of this, um, Is it is it four one six? I don't want to skip anything. Um, all right, let me let me let me go down to four one six because also we're gonna highlight four seventeen. Four one seven, we're gonna highlight that. Let me hit four one six real real quick. Um, that diversion got me thinking. Uh, as as a, let, me, let me bring it back. Let me bring it back real quick. Um, but I want you guys to think, think. Don't just sit here and listen. Think for a minute. Along with millions of other African Americans, along with, with I, along with millions of other African Americans, have a European genealogy as well. Why do I not consider myself white? What if I lived amongst Asians? Would I not feel like them as well? Yes, the genetic code of my bloodline would still create me to be whatever it was, but my training, my education, would still have a profound effect upon what I thought of myself, regardless of my genetic makeup. Remember, your mind writes on your genes. Here's the highlight, 417. The deeper questions are, the, the, the deeper questions here 
with the achievement of our goals in mind. Remember what the goals were uh, over here on 411, okay? Uh, uh, the deeper questions here with the achievement of our goals in mind are, where do you begin your ethnic identity? Where do you start yourself culturally? Where do you begin politically? If we are to truly if we are to be truly reborn into a new people with new powers, we are going to have to rethink our cultural start and political beginnings. That's again, what it means to be a new people. You have to begin a new start. We have to agree upon a new beginning. We know that we come from this and we come from that, but we have to begin, we have to declare a beginning. You know, like America declares its beginning 1776, but it was existing before that. And we have to think of ourselves the same way. At some point, we have to declare ourselves, uh, well, we already have declared ourselves. We have to adopt the culture that we have just declared. We could start in 1973 and say, look, hip hop is 50 years old. 73 to 2023, 50 years old. But let us not also forget that we at the Temple of Hip Hop we derive our hip hop also from Dr. King, from Marcus Garvey, from Booker T. Washington, even on the Dr. King level, which is who is quoted in our actual gospel. 1963, um, you know, the I Have a Dream speech of uh, August, and, and, and wouldn't it be August? I mean, think about that. W wouldn't it be August? Let me go back real quick. Yeah. Wouldn't it be August? August 28th, 1963. That's 60 years of the I Have a Dream speech. In our gospel, we talk about how the I Have a Dream speech called us into existence. We're coming up, and it's August too, by the way. It's August. It could have been July. It could have been September. It could have been any month. Why is it August? August 11th, August 28th. I'm August 20th. What's all this August? Marcus Garvey, I think it was the 17th. August, Marcus Garvey. Come on, we can keep it. August. Civilization builders seem to be born in August. Or at least some of us. And here's Dr. King. So I mention that because even though we talk in 73, you can throw the 60 years on it, and that's 63. We're coming up on the 60th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. Why don't we try to pull that out this year and read that? I know hip hop's 50th anniversary is overwhelming, but let's not forget Dr. King's 60th on the I Have a Dream speech. Why do I mention that? Because in that I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King talks about becoming a new people. Not based on skin color, but content of character. Dr. King specifically spoke about black and white people coming together to form a biracial army. That's in the speech. Now, either we're going to take the man's speech seriously, or you're going to use it as just some cool poetry. You put his speech on the level of anything, any, any rhyme somebody said. Well, here at the temple, we're not doing that. We're taking the speech seriously. We take ourselves seriously, really. That's why we take the speech seriously. So looking at the speech, all of this, by the way, is, 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 is his, four, his 418. We are going to have to rethink our ethnic identities. And this begins with, and, th and this begins the true history of hip hop. In fact, we are going to have to pay more attention to the growth of the ethnicities to which we are already accustomed. Most people can't even keep up with the growth of the ethnicity to which they belong. Meaning that with all, their, with all the new technologies and new innovations in medicine, along with the new archaeological discoveries regarding the origins of human beings, the ethnicity that you may think you are right now may even be in question. The birth of a new people is the origin of a new history. Stop here. This now is going to open up a fourth lesson, and this is going to conclude this part of the read. Fourth lesson. Um, 
Let me just make a note here. This is where this lesson switches again, you know, as the lesson switch. What we just talked about was ethnicity from a cultural point of view, how we are calling ourselves white, black, so on, how the courts are, are not going with scientific evidence, they're going with uh, common knowledge, and race is created by what people believe. It's, there's no basis in nature for race, for the existence of race. It's a social construct. So we ask ourselves, literally, do we have to remain imprisoned by this social construct that, did, that we didn't even create? You gotta be able to think outside the box. And this is, the, this is that outside the box thinking. We can come up with a new human designation called hip hop and cure the problem of racism outright. We're not a race anymore. Racism's dead. We are a culture of consciousness, a civilization of character. We know what is right, we know what is wrong, and we do what is right. We know what is real, we know what is fake, and we do what is real. That's all it takes. We have four laws of our society. Health, love, awareness, wealth. We call it the H law. What more do we need than health, good health, love, giving love, receiving love, loving relationships, awareness, knowledge, all of it, knowledge of self, knowledge of environment, history, science, mathematics, you name it, awareness and wealth. We ain't supposed to be broke, y'all. Nothing in the universe says we're supposed to be broke and living in poverty. Nothing. It is our own disorganization that is making us like this. If we come together and form hip hopia, where we can concentrate the wealth of hip hop in one place, and when I say one place, meaning several places around the United States, this is where hip hop's port is. This is where the goods are coming into hip hop. This is where the donations are coming into hip hop. If we can do that, we would have saved our children. Uh, uh, we would have saved our children from what we grew up with and we will save ourselves in our older age. We don't have to go through what our parents are going through. Any of you that take care of an elder, you know what I'm talking about. This society has nothing for elders. You reach a certain age, they literally throw you away. If you don't have a loving family, a child that's willing to take care of you, if you haven't created a business, something that will sustain you, you're fucked, literally. And, and we better recognize that young people listening to me right now, you better recognize that. Because you could be rich today, broke tomorrow. You could be broke today, rich tomorrow. Your consciousness is gonna determine how long you stay broke, or how long you stay rich. And the word here is not even rich, it's wealthy. That's the word. Because rich really does deals with abundance. Money, resources, jewels, credit, rich. Ain't nothing wrong with being rich. Ain't nothing wrong with being rich. We just don't teach that here. <laughs> There's other places that teach you how to be rich. We teach you how to be wealthy. Wealth is also connected to health also connected to mental health, all forms of health, wealth. But wealth is really about well-being, which requires money in this particular society. Well-being requires money, but it's not about money, it's about the well-being. If you can get to the well-being without the money, you don't need the money, just get to the well-being. Get to the peace and the prosperity. Keep in mind as well that wealth, different from riches, but wealth is not based on the accumulation of resources. It's not based on how much you have. Wealth is based on how much you can give away. The one who is truly wealthy can part with something without feeling deprived. The one who is wealthy is just a person with one sandwich, but can cut the sandwich in half and offer that sandwich to someone who doesn't have. That's a wealthy person. You can be wealthy with $10 if you're willing to give $2 to somebody who don't have. 
you're wealthy. Imagine you driving down, you know, the highway and you get there and you see the veteran out there or whoever with the sign, I'm hungry, I'm homeless, help me. You may only have 20 singles on you. You're like, damn, I only got 20 singles. That's all I got. <laughs> okay. But if you manage to give out of your 20 singles, five of you, five dollars, five of your singles, let's say the person go by, you gave him five singles. You gave him one single. Let's keep it real. You gave him one single. You're wealthy. You're wealthy. You're wealthy in consciousness and you're wealthy to that person. That person don't care whether you got a million in your account or, or your account just was overdrawn or you don't even have an account. That person right there that's hungry don't care. If you got a dollar, that's wealth to that person and you're wealthy because you're able to impart wealth unto others. So wealth is a consciousness. The one who's giving is wealthy. The charitable one is wealthy. The volunteer, the intern is wealthy. Not the one hoarding the money or even making the money. That's not wealth. That's you making money. The wealth question comes in when how much can you part with without feeling like you are deprived? The ultimate form of wealth is to give it all away <laughs> and don't feel deprived. I gave it all away and I'm still chilling. That's a wealthy person. I'm so wealthy, I don't need money. The difference between riches and wealth, when you're rich, you have to spend $40 million to erect a, a, a hip hop museum when you're rich. When you're wealthy, the museum is giving to you. This is the difference. No, one is not better than the other. One is not worse than the other. You have to decide what kind of meal you wanna create for your mind. I like the health, love, awareness, and wealth meal. I eat very well under that law. Because I'm eating well under that law, I impart it unto you. If you can comprehend this. We gave hip hop freely to the world. Hoping that others in other lands and so on can lift themselves up like we lifted ourselves up from nothing to something. You know what it is. So... I'm gonna cut the read off here and we'll continue next week or whenever I catch up with this read again because now we're gonna go into genes. This is the genetic part of the read now. We're talking about identity. We're talking about creating a new identity. So we talked about the philosophy of it. We talked about the political and cultural aspects of it. Now we're gonna talk about the genetic aspect of it, but that's its own its own lecture, its own teaching. So we're going to stop here uh, with that. And of course, I want to thank you all for joining us here today. Every Sunday, you know how it goes down. Uh, Twelve o'clock is the Temple of Hip Hop, and as I said, I'm honored and proud to be in our actual facility here. We have much work to do. We ask for your support, and let me give a special shout out to those who donate to the Temple of Hip Hop. Now more than ever, your donation is needed. Here we are right here. You know God provides for us. Uh, and, 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 you know, we're going to make this work. But as a temple for hip hop, part of God's pro 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 um, providence, <laughs> part, of, part of God's provision for us comes from us, comes from us. How wealthy are you then? Can you part with $100 a month? Can you part with volunteering your time and your effort? Can you bring your talents here and give us a talent that may cost <clears throat> money and you're able to impart that talent for, to, to us, donate that talent? How wealthy are you? How wealthy are you? Um, I'm here at the Temple of Hip Hop, 55 Ludlow, 
Uh, it is what it is. Newark, New Jersey is on the rise. Shout out to Red Man. Shout out to Naughty by Nature, Queen Latifah, Whitney Houston, and a whole host of others. Dupree Kelly, shout out to Lords of the Underground as well. Councilman Dupree Kelly, uh, Mr. Dupree Kelly. Uh, allow me to shout him out real quick. This is what we're doing right here in the great city of Newark, the New Ark. Uh, Jay Best taught us that last week. The New Ark, the New Covenant. What does the gospel start with? Mm, mm, mm. If, I, if I recall correctly, um, we start with something called a new covenant. The gospel started with a new covenant, a new ark, something to protect you, something covering you, something with the new ark. These are, this is not coincidence. This is the science of mind. This is the knowledge of the universe. This is how it works. Don't just sit there and watch me. Be inspired to change, transform, and empower your own life. I'm KRS-One. Thanks for listening.